By now, you're probably familiar with the idea that we all have a money story and how that story for many of us is negative. These feelings are based on beliefs ingrained in us during our childhood and then shape our reality today. You're listening to Queer Money, episode number 514, and today we're joined by intuitive guide Scott Clover, who shares how we can rewrite those stories and yield better results today. Scott is an expert on somatic technologies and body energy and shares the tips and tools he uses with his clients. Now on with the show. The mission of Queer Money is to financially empower the LGBTQ plus community. Join us in thanking Capital One for supporting that mission. Welcome, Scott Clover, to the Queer Money Podcast. We're looking forward to a, a woo-woo discussion with you. Uh, thank you. I'll try my best. <laughs> I know That's you're going to do not woo-woo, huh? <laughs> woo-woo, yeah. Totally. All right, so we're going to talk a lot about overcoming your money story and intuitive healing and kind of work that you do. So to set a baseline for our audiences, what is intuitive healing? And if it's intuitive, why can't I do it to myself? <laughs> sure. So the intuitive aspect of my job is that I see and sense patterns. And I can see and sense those patterns in and around a person's body, a person's energy field, their genetic pattern. If they were adopted, that's different than their family pattern. So the family pattern can can and similar can be similar or different from a genetic pattern. It can be a timeline issue, a past life. It can be something that happened to your grandfather. That's going to probably what where we're going to stem a lot of our talk today is maybe there's a pattern in your family about money that, that's been hindering you, et cetera. But intuitive energy healing or energy healing is using the somatic or innate intelligence of our bodies, our body energies. Some people call them chakras, um, auras. Uh, sixth sense, any of these terms that are out there, uh, they can probably apply somehow to my work. My work specifically is non-dogmatic, so I don't come from a, a religious background or any sort of dogmatic teachings. It's really about uh, energy patterns and how those patterns either get repeated, get transmuted, get observed. And once you observe a pattern, then it can change. But for a lot of us, a lot of our subconscious patterns are, are formed before the age of seven. So after the fact, traumas can happen and those can lay into your subconscious, but your basic subconscious is formed by the age of seven for most of us our age. For younger kids these age, I don't know why, but it's, it's, it's becoming younger to about the age of six if you have nieces or nephews or kids. And mm -hmm. the younger kids these days, they're, they're locking in their subconscious around six, whereas people my age and, and maybe a little younger than me, it was seven years old. So those patterns repeat and repeat and repeat and generally can't be seen by the person repeating those patterns. If you could observe that pattern, then it would change, right? So the intuitive part of my job is I see and sense energy patterns. If you call me and we do a session together, then I'm going to see and sense a pattern in and around your body or your storyline. And then once observed, then the pattern can change. But for a lot of us, we have, we wear horse blinders. Even for me, myself, I, I read, I read other people much better than I read myself. <laughs> Right. And I try not to read friends, family members when I go out to dinner, when I go to a restaurant. No, I am not reading people's energies. I I was uh, contracted about my energy and my, my intuition for so long that I have a really strong muscle to hold it down. And I open it up when I work and then I close it back down again. So I can go about my daily life, go to the grocery store without seeing everyone's aura or seeing, you know, past life traumas, things that happen to people. So I really open it up for work and then I shut it down for my daily life, if you will. Got you. So you're not reading us right now. Generally, no, no. Unless you ask, it's it would be intrusive for me, frankly. Sure, sure. Um, unless you ask, or it's in a healing cycle or a healing process, or if you say, "Can you help my friend or read my friend?" Um, it generally is for the benefit of the person. I'm not going to read someone just because I can. That seems a bit maybe unethical to me. Sure. Um, and also, it would be boring and fatiguing. Yeah. to read everybody's energies all the time. How, how monotonous. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I like to be surprised just as much as the next psychic. So yeah. I, I'm thinking about, I can't remember the name of the movie. Um, I think it was Mel Gibson and Helen Hunt, uh, where he could all of a sudden something happened and one day he could hear everything that um, women were saying. And oh, yeah. then it was like towards the end of the movie, he thought it was going to be this really cool thing. And towards the end of the movie, he's like, I can't stand this anymore because all I can't, I can't turn it off, which is, 
you know, probably the situation you would be in if you were just constantly reading people, which you would get exhausted. Well, I think that that holds up for a lot of empathic people. If you don't know your energetic boundaries and studied yours the way I've studied mine. I mean, I studied for years before I went anywhere near client work. Um, I studied my own energies and my own patterns and the reason why I acted and reacted to certain things and the betrayals I went through and the money issues, or in my case, it was the opposite. I, you know, I, money sort of came to me because I, I just expected it to, and it just did. So, um, there's different things. And then when something happens, then money can dry up because you feel contracted about money or money becomes an issue between you and a family member or you and a friend. So then money loses its charm to you and its energetic resonance. And then all of a sudden something happens and you're in a different uh, spending cycle or you're in a different uh, receiving cycle and you're not making as much money. And then all of a sudden something might good to happen or esteemable happens and then you get a slight windfall or you get money from somewhere else. So money is really just energy. It's vibrational, just the way most relationships are. And if you think of it as a reciprocity, as a yin yang, as a lingam yoni, as a male female, female is generally receiving energy, male generally energy is on the right side of the body and that's sending out energy. And it doesn't equate to men and women or genitalia, it's more receiving and sending out, right? The lingam yoni, the yin yang. Um, and we see that all throughout our cultures for thousands of, of, of years it's been happening. Res the, that, comp that idea of reciprocity, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And a lot of people are stymied when it comes to money because something in their past has shifted them out of a reciprocity mindset. You got to spend money to make money is one of the analogies we've heard growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, for a lot of us, that's true. If you're not advertising or marketing, then how are people going to know about you, for example? Right. that's These aren't always the case. Like, for example, I don't advertise. I'm word of mouth. But I sent out that frequency to say... I would like people who are interested in my work to find me. And so if I go out plugging myself too much, it might give off to me a false impression. So energetically, I put out in the world that I'm word of mouth because the people that gain from a session with me will then tell them their friends or family or at a dinner party. And that's generally how I get most of my clients. Do you find, it could just be the space that David and I are in, but do you find that um, people are most bottlenecked about finances than maybe any other area of their lives? Oh, that's a, that's a really broad statement. I mean, it's relationships, right? What is your relationship to money? If you have man problems or women problems or partner problems, then what is your relationship to the same sex or opposite sex, depending on your relationship? So it really is, it's a relational issue. Mm -hmm. and, and you can take money out and put in a different word, food. You could put in self-respect. You could put in self-reliance. So it's just another aspect or a vibration of something that's in your life or not in your life. And are you bringing it towards you? Are you sending the universe signals that it should be drawn towards you? It should money migrate to you or do you need to run out and grab it, right? Those are two different mindsets of how to achieve a financial stability. Do I need to wake up every day and hustle, hustle, hustle and make money because my grandfather worked on the line and that's what he did. And so that's what was stilled in my family is I have to work hard every single day. And then you have a friend who, you know, works four hours a week and makes double the amount of money that you do. So what are they putting out in the universe that's different than what you're putting out in the universe? Now, that person that's working four or five hours a week and making double you are may not be any happier. Their life may be miscontented but they just seem to vibrate with the aspect that money can work with me or support me as if like the wind beneath a glider. Mm -hmm. Or do you need to flap your wings like Jonathan Livingston Seagull to accomplish getting, getting to that plateau? And it really depends on how, who do you think you are? And then what are you vibrating like? And I, you said woo woo at the beginning and I much prefer the other woo woo. Um, <laughs> woo woo is a term that I doesn't really apply to my work. Um, you know, spirituality, once again, is not a word that I use in my work because it's energy. Mm -hmm. And patterns can be affected. As I said, they can be transmuted, shifted, altered, embellished, taken away from, migrated. All of these different energy terms can happen if you set your will to it. Mm -hmm. Or if you let go of one of the reasons why you're having a contraction about the money in the first place. 
And once again, this can be relation. It's it's relational. It can be a relationship situation, just the way it would be with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Right. I, I appreciate that you bringing that up and kind of using that analogy, um, because you know we have this we have this uh, this saying in our culture: money doesn't buy happiness. Um, it, because so many of us have seen people who have money and aren't happy right? And other aspects of their lives. And, and it's the kind of the same thing with, we can have a really, we have, we have a best friend who we actually adore and love. And then we have someone else in our life who is constantly, we have an acrimonious relationship. They're just different relationships. They're with different people, but you're kind of saying it's the same thing with all these various aspects of our lives. So money, our sexual relationships, our family relationships, our work relationships, all of these are different kinds of relationships that can either be positive or negative depending on how we relate to that relationship. And I would even say affirming or non-affirming or esteemable or or positive and negative also is very charged and and binary. Yeah. Yeah. So is it affirming to your situation or not? I mean, I got to tell you, are we allowed to swear? Yes, no problem. <laughs> um, you know, I'm from New York and I've lived in New York a long, long time. And I have plenty of, of people that I've met over my lifetime that are trust fund babies. And their minds are just as, as fucked up about money as people who grew up poor. They either over understand it or it's been beaten into them that the family means so much or this, this money comes with so much responsibility attached to it. Then it's a burden. It's not a release. Oh, this person inherited a bunch of money, but you know how many strings, how many apron strings and grandparent strings that came with? It, it, it can be so confining to a person's psyche if they choose to allow it to pressure them that way. Mm-hmm. The same way as a tax bill that you can't pay. The same way as if your credit card goes up to 28% because you thought you could pay it off with a zero interest and then you got waylaid and doesn't. I mean, I think this is what you guys talk a lot about. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand money and understand that you can use your credit as a shell game to get, you know, the wolf off your back, then you're not aware of that. Mm -hmm. Just the way you're not aware that you can talk to the IRS if you have a a lien against you or if there's money owed. People are willing to work with you if you step up to the plate. If you show up and say, this is the situation I'm in, this is a lot about what I teach in my work and my mentor really drilled into my head is accept the existing reality. Mm -hmm. How many people wait a month and then another month and another month because their credit card is is overdue and it's going up higher interest rate and higher interest rate. They just don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, then they've spent $400 and $500 in, in fees when they could have just accepted the existing reality three months ago and figured out a way to find lower interest rates or, or things like that. Right. But if you're intimidated by the fact or intimidated that you can't speak your mind about it, then that's also a detracting moment. And a lot of times it just, if you missed your payment by a day, just call the company up and say, wow, I, you know, I slept in or I, I'm hung over and I missed my payment. Oh, you've been a member for 20 years. I'm going to waive the payment. I've had an American Can Express card for 38 years or something, it says on my card. So when I call them up and ask, it's just because I ask and, and generally they waive fees, for example. <laughs> this is just an example of, of how you might understand that your situation isn't as pigeonholing as you think it is financially. It really is how you perceive your situation. Sure. Capital One Auto Navigator does more than just auto financing. We're here to help you find a car you love, too. Shop millions of cars from thousands of dealers nationwide. Research your favorite makes and models. Explore dealers near you and more. All on Auto Navigator. So what are some common patterns or behaviors that do arise for individuals that you work with uh, when it comes around financial trauma? What are you typically seeing among people? So it's been, my work is very individualized. Like, as I say, I, the intuition part of my job is I'm very intuitive and I see a specific pattern or I'll see a kink in your energetic hose or patterning from a specific age and we'll find, we'll go in and find that age. But if I generalize it, I'll say you have to fail. You have to fail at what was expected of you from your family so you can exceed at being yourself. Meaning, if you were, if, if your family comes from a very traditional generational family and you are expected to do or be something and you come out of the womb and all of a sudden you're non-binary or you're queer or you're, you know, I was born in the, the 70s. So 
it was a little different back then. It was either gay or gay or straight. That was it. Are you lesbian or are you straight? That's it. You you couldn't be anything either other than those two. Right. Where now we have this, you know, excuse the pun, but rainbow of potentials. And if you don't fit under what you think your great grandfather, your grandfather thought you should be, then you have to fail at that. And a lot of us don't know how to fail or don't expect to fail or don't want to fail. Hmm. So, but if you realize that you have to fail at what was expected of you so you can win at being yourself, that for a lot of us holds us back. If your family, if you come from a traditional family, like an Asian family, that there's so much expectation put on the this type of child or that type of child and the expectation could be this, that, and the other thing, and you don't achieve that because you want to be an artist or an actor or self-expressive, then you have to fail at, at what was expected of you by that generational family. And once you realize that you're not letting your family down, per se, by being yourself, then that's a pattern that can shift out of. But a lot of people try to grow up and, and hold both of those things, to be the perfect son and also the perfect artist. Well, the perfect son in the parent's mind would be to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Whereas the artist inside of you just says, I, I wanna make as much money as it takes to feed myself and my soul and my creativity. So is this kind because, of getting to the point where people, uh, to sometimes people pleasers, they're trying to please everybody. And then of course you can't, Somebody's going to be disappointed with that, right? Well, this is a queer audience. So I would say it's more than just people pleasing. I would say you have to release your family's shame. You have to release the shame that your family felt when they found out that you were going to be different and that you weren't going to not not be different. Excuse the double negative. But you're not going to tow the family line and, and get married the way you're supposed to or be in this situation. You're going to express yourself individually. When you do that in your family, it's really unacceptable to the people who aren't able to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, add on to that financial freedom. A lot of gay people don't have children, so they have more disposable income. That brings on more sort of uh, discerning feelings from your, your family members, potentially. Well, what do you mean you went off to the white party and now you're going off to this party and that party and, you know, well, I'm not paying for my kids food and school and all this other stuff. So the, the individual who's making the money can go to the dinosaur open or can go to the gay ski weeks, right? And still not worry that they have to save money for, for college. So that can be intimidating to the people who see our lifestyle and say, oh, they're, you know, now I'm feeling judgmental towards them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm starting to, once you feel judgment from your family because you're excelling, that's super frustrating to a sensitive person. So then you think subconsciously, what am I doing to offend these people? And all you're really doing is making more money than them. So now you have sort of an envy situation. Yeah. Right. Or in some cases, maybe we're making less money than them, but we don't have the financial responsibilities that they have. So we're able to spend our money on things that it, however they it perceive appear. it. Yeah, right. exactly. It however they appear. Yeah, exactly. And there, because we are a marginalized society, it's, we're going to be criticized more frequently and, and more vehemently than, than the others. Look at all the other societies out there that have to say the same thing. So yeah, you can make the exact same money as a peer or even less and have a more lavish lifestyle because you're not spending it on other things. Sure. But a lot of gay men don't save money. I mean, I think that's why you guys exist, right? Yeah. And lesbian households, I think if, if this was back, you know, my research from 10 years ago, but the lesbian household was one of the least paid households in the United States. So why is that? Is it a sense of not deserved? Is it not deserving? Is it, I know people older than me, you know, I came out the same week as Rock Hudson. So most of the people that I knew that were gay or that were five years older than me all thought they were going to die in a 10-year right. period. So right. money didn't mean a whole lot to the people older than me in the gay community because they just all assumed they were going to die. And this isn't too dull to me, but once that shifted, a lot of those people didn't have any savings because what did they need savings for? And then the medical, the, the medicines changed. And now we have people living 20, 30, 40, 50 years on with HIV meds, which is wonderful. But their mindset may not have kicked back in. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. When you're told you're going to die and then all of a sudden you're not, well, what does that say about your pocketbook? What does right. that say about your bank account? Yeah. So, how might this past trauma or the, the trauma that I'm dealing with now, trying to please everybody, how might this show up in my life? How do I identify if this is a challenge that I'm having? Well, generally, if you say, I'm sorry more than you need to, 
<laughs> then you generally are a people pleaser. I don't apologize, apologize for shit. <laughs> no, that's good. But you may know somebody that's, that's that. oh, he I'm doesn't. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, um, well, money traumas is just an energy frequency trauma. Mm hmm. It's it. I, am I deserve it of this or am I not deserve it of this? And if there is internalized shame or your family feels internalized shame towards you, then you're going to perceive that. So a lot of times what I work with my client is release your family's shame. Then a whole bunch of new energies flood into the person because there's not this block of I shouldn't because I'm not worthy. A lot of us subconsciously growing up queer think we're not worthy. Right. Well, what's what's in that word? Worth. And then we call it self-worth. What mm -hmm. is your, or what do you fill out that form for the bank? Your worth statement or statement of worth, right? Right. Yeah. Well, it's the same word. Is it self-esteem or is it money? For a lot right. of people, those can be the same things. A lot of people, a Prada bag means something. But frankly, that bag isn't that much more expensively made than the one next to it. It's just the superficial aspect and the marketing attached to it. And mm -hmm. what does that make you feel? Now, there's nothing wrong with getting a Prada bag. But if you're not going to eat for a week because you want that Prada bag, then that's not a, a, a valid financial decision. But if you save up you know, $400 a month for five months to buy that bag and it makes you feel esteemable and people perceive you as esteemable, then it works for you. So it really is, what is the pattern and what are you trying to find out? Is it esteemable? Or are you just trying to fill in a shame divot? So it's, if, if I'm understanding correctly, you're there, it's something I've not thought about before, but it, a lot of LGBT people have their own shame about being LGBT that they carry with themselves because of what society has sort of imposed on us. But are you, you're then also saying that some of us still have to shake the shame that our family has with us not coming out straight? Well, you asked what are some of the impediments, and that is one of the right. impediments. The shame we hold from our families. Right. Right. We may have come out, but pride is not an esteemable act. Pride is below that. Pride is one of the seven deadly, deadly sins. Is it wonderful that we as a group of people in such a short amount of time, in the matter of decades since I was, you know, rallying, at the marches on Washington that we've come this far, it's miraculous. Mm -hmm. But pride is not going to get us much further. What's gonna get us above that is esteemable acts. And if saving $100 a month or $30 a paycheck is an esteemable act for you, then it creates density. And when you see that money growing in your, in your savings account every month, that creates a financial density. Well, what happens to a dense planet? It has a gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. So money can be, can have its own gravitational pull if you decide to create something worth having that. And you can put your money in stocks with dividends and you can maybe explain to people what that is. And you just leave it there and knowing that it's clicking away every quarter that you receive, you know, $2 to that stock and you reinvest it. Or you can be more proactive. But if you're putting a sense of want or need into watching your stock that you bought go up or down, then you're putting too much energy be behind the sense of just allowing success, mm -hmm. right? To, to watch pot never boils, they say, it's because you're putting too much tension in the watching and not allowing it to grow or allowing it to just be. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So can you share some... When you positive outcomes when you, with people that you work with, if they realize they have, they, they see these patterns in themselves and they do some exercises with you, what is the, what are the positive outcomes that they typically see? Well, it can be from becoming a manager to becoming a senior vice president. It can be, oh, I'm deserving of that job. It can be stepping up and putting up a boundary and having people look at you at your job and go, wow, that person put up a boundary and that boundary served the whole department. Right. For a lot of us empathic people, putting up a boundary is not necessarily good for our personal relationships because we've been in relationships with people who have taken advantage of our boundaries. Mm -hmm. So if you put up a boundary, you might gain new friends, but you might lose old friends. But if you put up a boundary at work, it, people are going to lift their heads up and go, oh, putting up a boundary is an esteemable act. That's something that can be followed. And that person might get a better job or get viewed by the people above that they're taking some more personal responsibility. 
back when I was in college in the late 80s, I taught personal ethics and business responsibility at the University of Minnesota. And one of the things we taught even back then was this sense of authenticity. It's, it's changed and morphed so much in the last 30 years from, from that concept of, am I telling the truth or not telling the truth? It was very binary authenticity. Whereas authenticity now is, am I speaking a truth that I can live by? Can I get behind the words and the actions that I'm doing? And sometimes we go to our jobs and we just can't because our jobs are doing something that we don't believe in. So that's going to be another money issue is you're gaining money in a job that you don't believe the mission statement of the company, or you know that something hinky is going on behind the scenes, but you still go in for your paycheck. Well, what does that say to your soul? Yeah. It says you're, you're self-victimizing or in the archetypal speak, I work a lot with the archetypes. What we're talking about is the prostitute archetype. And that's not so literal. It's not sex for money. It's when do we sell ourselves out? or the enlightened form of that is your guardian of faith or your guardian of belief. When do I have enough belief and faith in my own actions, words, esteemability, that I can get paid a value that I'm worth? And that goes for a lot of practitioners or artists who think they need to keep their prices low because they won't sell as much. No, that's not necessarily the case. It's what is it worth? And your time is worth just as much if you're creating a piece of art as that corporate executive's time is while they're sending emails or on the phone, or I don't even know what corporate executives do anymore. They just exec. <laughs> they just exec. But, you know, I can tell you, I, I used to own a couple of businesses back in my 20s and 30s. And the one thing I really enjoyed was uh, doing esteemable things for my employees, watching my employees uh, get some fulfillment out of their job, right? I delegated a lot of the work when I took over, a, I owned a travel agency and I turned it into a gay travel agency as well back in the nineties. And a lot of times I delegated a lot of the work, mostly because the women that had been working at that agency before I took it over knew what they were doing much better than I did. They didn't need someone younger coming in and telling them how to do their work. They just needed to be supported in what they did. And I took a failing business and turned it into something quite, quite successful. So it, it is about looking at the people around you and saying, what's their self-worth? How can I embellish and embolden the people around me in my work group, whether that means you're above them at work or below them at work? If you sign their paychecks, then go out of your way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't sign their paychecks, then make an effort, right? Because you go to that office every day. Why should it be a dismal place? Right. One of the things that I that this, I'm thinking a few steps back in your conversation is this idea that um, that our money problems and our money story may not be specifically related to money. There's a Very possibility so. that that some other aspect of our lives has cascaded into our money story, or it has, it, it has formulated some habits and some thinking behaviors in us and that's then how we we overlay those on top of other aspects of our lives including the financial aspects of our lives sure one is i'm over trusting people for me as i said i over trusted and gave most of my money away to people who guaranteed they would give it back to me and then guess what the minute they got it they disappeared or just were disingenuous on the the parlay so I had to take that on the chin and move to the next thing. But if I harbored resentment about it or beat myself up because I was being generous and they were being whatever in their mindset was the, the justification for doing uh, sort of nefarious or felonious things, that's the nature of business, unfortunately, particularly in, in the Western culture today. Yeah. So I would say, get it in writing. <laughs> if you're gonna go into business with somebody, definitely get things in writing, but also understand are, where do you overgive or where do you take too much? And that's out of reciprocity. And when your saloon doors are swinging both ways, letting energy in and out, then you're going to feel more equal in your body. And that doesn't matter if you have $10 in your bank account or 10 million in your bank account. Um, money isn't happiness, but feeling comfortable means that you can then apply that money to other things like energy healing or acupuncture or massage or getting a trainer you know that's what money actually does is it can create esteemable moments if you allow it to those esteemable moments build up and then that becomes sort of an emboldened sense of self yeah. 
But if you're scrambling every day from a lack of uh, or an, an idea that I'm lacking and I need more, 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 you know, need and want, I say, are four letter words when you're talking about energy. It mm. makes it more elusive. So if you're you got three part time jobs trying to make ends meet, what happens next? What are you saying to the energy pattern around you? Right. And where is your self-worth in that discussion? And if you really like scrapping and if you really like being busy, you know, some of my best friends over the years love whatever they do in the service industry mm -hmm. and they wouldn't change it for the world. And that's so great to see somebody be of service. Right. But now how patronizing can some people be to people in the service industry? Right. So what does that right. say about the person patronizing the person in the service industry? Right. You know, I had a, a famous friend once and we went out to dinner and I was introducing him to my now husband and he was rude to the waiter. And that was it. I just, I never called him back again, just because you're rich and famous. And, and he was really nice for all the times I'd hung out with him before, but that dinner, he was rude to the waiter and that was it. I just, you're off the Christmas card list. I'm sorry. That's not, <laughs> you can be rich and famous all you want, but you don't, you don't talk down to people who are just doing a service. Right. Right. And if you understand that about yourself, where are you judging yourself? One of the aspects and cornerstones of my job, and I think we talked about this before a little bit uh, offline, was joy and judgment can't live in the same moment. So if you're judging where you're at because you don't have the right bag or the right shoes or the right trip, and you're not accepting your existing reality and saying, wow, I'm not going to judge where I'm at. I'm going to observe where I'm at and ex ex uh, expect or bring in a different vibration, then it can shift and change. But if your mindset is a state of lacking or a judgment or a beating yourself up because I'm this or I'm that, you're going to stay in that pity well. Mm -hmm. So accepting the existing reality, I work too much. I'm not getting paid enough. That's the existing reality. Saying I want to get paid more is only going to keep you in a state of lack. Sure. And going Does back to the beginning, sense to everybody, you it does. Going back to the beginning, I think you, you mentioned that simply identifying that pattern can change the behavior and therefore the result. Is that what Yes. Or forgiving yourself. Say, I forgive myself because I failed what my family expected me to be. And if you do that, then you can say, now I appreciate myself for being myself. Mm -hmm. Bring on the money. <laughs> Turn on the valve. Right. Mm -hmm. Let the money flow to me now that I've let go of this thing I'm that I failed at. But mm -hmm. a lot of us wake up in midlife and go, I'm not what my family expected me to be. And now I need to make money. Well, right. start today. Yeah. You I, should I, be what you expect you to be. Anything other than that is going to cause you some issues. And if money's wrapped around that or success, or if you have a family member who's narcissistic and is jealous of your success or resentful is even worse, then that's somebody you're going to have to really uh, understand your situation with and say, wow, I smell resentment. Stay the hell away from that person. <laughs> yeah. They're going to bring you down. Yeah. Well, it's kind of having two different, going down two different paths there what, based on what you were just saying, but I'm going to go with the latter one for right now, this whole idea of, of, um, forgiving yourself uh, and uh, letting go of these expectations of your family. Um, you know, I think that when we look at suicide rates among, among men, I, I'm not surprised that we see such a, a, a high number of individuals who are in their late 40s, early 50s who are, are committing suicide because that's kind of the that time frame of when you're looking at and assessing your life, did I give my family, um, whether that's your your children or your spouse, if you're in a same-sex relationship and don't have children, we look at ourselves and then we start saying, okay, did I have I done what everybody's expected of me? And you're a lot of us feel like our lives are over at that point. And you know, 40, 45, 50, 55 years old, we're starting to weigh in on all these judgments about the results of our lives and thinking that we can't go any further. But if we were, if we're able to let go of some of those or forgive our, our, ourselves for the things that expectations of our family, we may be allowing ourselves to have a much more uh, 
self-caring and forgiving nature for taking care of our lives. Very much so. A self-worth, once again, I'll go back to self-worth. Yeah. If you're a 50 year old man and you decide, oh, I'm going to let go of whatever expectations my family's had now that your parents are older or dead, it can be so uh, cathartic for people, no matter what age. It doesn't matter how, how old you are. I have a client who's in her 70s and she's still unfurling childhood situations from the time her power was taken away from her. Mm. And she gets a lot out of it just putting those building blocks, those energy blocks back in her story. And if we can figure out where our own stories, energy blocks got taken away from us, or we gave them away because we felt like we were intimidating someone else. As I said, if you feel or sense resentment as an empath and you don't know what it is, you're going to do almost anything you can to make sure that feeling goes away. And if that means limiting your own behavior because the person resent you, resents this new thing you bought or this new level you've achieved, you will actually self-sabotage yourself to make sure that resentment feeling isn't felt. And that's a real mm. tra tragedy to a lot of us. We don't even know we're doing it, but resentment is so powerful of a feeling that most empaths will do almost anything to not feel it in their family or their friendship circle right? or chosen family. Right. Interesting. So hang around people who support you, hang around people who, yeah. you know, you would like to support. That when you think they did well or got a, a promotion, that it makes you smile, right? If you can put that energy out in the world, then hopefully more people will put that energy out towards you. But if you're the first thing you think of is, oh, Paul got the job and I didn't, or Paul got a promotion and I didn't, that's judgment. And you just like stabbed yourself with a little tiny knife. And that happens over and over and over again. When you judge other people's situation and compare it to your own, it's only going to hinder you and it's only going to hold you back. So but I've if got you to ask, appreciate, go ahead. I've got to ask then, um, are you seeing this becoming an increasing problem with social media, specifically Instagram, where people are just putting on the curating the best versions of their lives? Correct. And the filters and the, you know, I climbed a mountain for five hours just to take one photo. And so all the, all the people see is the, 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 ep, ep, you know, the, the peak photo and not the whole travail to get there. It, it doesn't make sense to us. So then we think, look what they have, what I don't have. That's almost self-resenting. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, Instagram, the reels, the TikToks, the embellishments, the, this need for marks and labels and fancy cars, you know, those are all wonderful if you have the money to spend on them. But if your life is lacking basic resources or basic sense of enjoyment because you're trying to put on airs or keep up with the Joneses, then you know what I think once again, that's something you help people with, but you're dealing with a superficial environment that's based on judgment. And there's not gonna be a lot of joy there. The more work you do is to then judge or be judged by others. You're taking a lot of joy potential out of your life instead of learning piano or learning crochet or learning needlepoint or playing a new sport, whatever it is that you're spending money or time on to try and get judged differently, you're not spending a lot of time in, in what makes you feel light. You're not reaching back to your childhood and saying, wow, I really enjoyed making jewelry for my sister when I was 10, or I really enjoyed coloring or this and that, and then incorporating that hobby. And God knows maybe one of those hobbies that you turn into could make money on the side. How many reels do you see of people saying, oh, I tried a hobby and now I sold four prints for $20,000 each. Who knew I was an artist that was stuck in there until I was 35? You know, these stories are real. Yeah. These stories are people tapping back into their creativity, tapping into what titillated them as a child, what, what sparked their creativity as a child. And if you can bring that into your current job or a hobby that you sell on Etsy or something like that, then that's an esteemable act because you're getting paid for something you love to do. And if that means at a job and you they have a singing group and you didn't know it, then join the singing group at your job. And let your if you work at Google, for example, Google has a chorus. Join the chorus. It's just find something esteemable about what you're doing and try to take the doldrum out of the day to day. There's a singing group at our company too, but David won't join it with me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Shower singing. <laughs> no, he sings everywhere. 
I figured. <laughs> no, it's just in the shower. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it is interesting. You were talking about that whole idea of uh, of judging, whether you're judging um, or you're uh, you're protecting yourself, trying to protect yourself from being judged by others. And it seems like whenever uh, we're protecting or trying to protect ourselves from uh, being judged by others, if we're constantly doing that in a way that is superficial it's never going to end we're going to you're going to have to keep that that keep that going it's there we will never satisfy other people's judgments of it's us. it's a ladder it's a ladder with continual rungs there, yeah, we, there, uh, the, the rung will always be in front of you if you create it correct right you know i'm going back to this idea buying buying the bag right you know if you buy the bag so that you aren't judged by others or you're judged um in the in a in a, an approving way by others, you're going to have to buy another bag sooner sooner or later because they are going to want you to have the latest one, right? If you're being judged by somebody, they're going to judge you. If they're judging you based on what you have, and as soon as what you have is next is last season, you're going to have to update that to to keep in their good graces. But if you save the money and buy the bag because this is what you truly want and you have a much stronger desire for it then you probably don't need to get a new bag every season because the one you have is the one that satisfies you. Correct. Or it's what got you in the door to get your job. Yeah. Right? If you buy the fancy shoes and the person interviewing you likes your fancy shoes, then that got you in the door. Right? But it's buying it for the right reason. If you're buying it solely for superficial purposes, then you are being financially irresponsible to keep it in vain of what this is about. Yeah. But if it's if it's builds up your self-worth and your self-esteem and allows you to walk into the room with your head held high and be perceived differently, then you're changing your energetic frequency and you're allowing money to do that in a beneficial way. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to what you said very early on about we we pick up some of these um behaviors or this, this unconscious beliefs from before we're at the age of seven or now apparently the age of, of six, what yeah. is the evolutionary value in us being so unconsciously impressionable up until the age of six or seven and then not being able to easily correct ourselves as we age? I don't know if that's, that's the best word to use, but what, what, there has to be some evolutionary value to being so impressionable and then not being aware of what's affecting you as an adult. Does that make sense? Yes, but you're talking about a, an evolutionary shift that's only happened within since the Industrial Revolution. Most mm. people before 100 years ago never left their village. Most people never saw 20 kilometers outside of where they were born. So you're applying millions of years of evolutionary protection qualities to something that we don't have really much control over or insight to because we can only study the last few generations. Mm -hmm. And now you add computers to it and it adds a whole nother nuance. So what you're saying is, wow, how, what I'm getting at is these patterns have changed so abruptly in the last hundred years that we don't know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's no pattern to really grab onto. But I can tell you, if you were raised in a certain type of household, and one of the examples is Italian females, that, that's one of the most uh, challenging uh, groups that I work with is because of, to be an Italian female, particularly on the East Coast, you are supposed to act and react a certain way, particularly when men are in, around. And when you go away from that or go outside the flock, then it really causes strife. And if you're not subordinate to a man on certain qualities, you're looked, up as, you're looked at as say, the, black, the black sheep of the family. That's just one example. That's why Madonna's been ruffling feathers since she was born. That would be an example of of going the opposite direction and rebelling against and people really being drawn to the way that she rebelled against that upbringing, correct? Let's see. Very well said. <laughs> the same could be said with Ali Wong, right? Oh, yeah. Right. I could see right? that. Yep. Um, that would be another example from a from a actor standpoint. Right. But breaking these stereotypes is is what queer people were supposed to do anyway. That's why you were born in that body. So don't confine. Don't conform 
to an ideology that says I'm a lesbian, so I must make less, or I'm a gay man, so I must be frivolous with my money, or I'm a hairdresser, so I must not save it and spend it all on Monday nights. You know, these are all things that I heard growing up that are just no longer true. Right. But they're so hard to, it's almost like, I mean, this is what you were getting at. It's almost like this is the expectation. I mean, there, there have been studies that have come out to show that LGBTQ plus people gravitate to certain careers. Um, and they're very often the stereotypical careers that we gravitate to. So if you're an LGBT person and you don't necessarily want to become a hairdresser or want to be do something artistic, if that's not your thing, it's almost hard to not get sucked into that because that's sort of almost the expectation of the culture. So the work that you're doing with your clients, it sounds like, can help them break free and live their actual truth. Yes, but I, you know, I'm on LinkedIn a lot and a lot of my LinkedIn connections are LGBT professionals, which I used to be a member of when I owned my businesses. So um, that's changed so much to walk into an office with a suit and tie on and have the best looking suit in the office. Well, that's just sort of the role of the gay guy, right? Right. Um, but that doesn't belittle him anymore the way it did when I was younger. You know, when I was in Detroit and I was on the board of directors of the Gay and Lesbian Community Center, I was one of only a handful of gay business owners. And this was back in the, the late 90s. And there was one executive out in all of America, corporate America. There was one gay executive. He worked at Ford. And the only reason why they brought him back was his expertise because Ford was failing. And he was the only out executive that we could even look at. Mm -hmm. Now, to this day, we've got Tim Cook and I went to a party a couple of weeks ago and the, the, the owners of the apartment was a gay man and his partner and he runs a, a Fortune 500 company. Not a blip on the radar. The media yeah. doesn't even talk about it anymore. The guy from Chat AI or whatever, he's he's a queer. The guy that does the, the uh, statistics on CNN we're becoming, you know, we're everywhere was what we used to talk about in the nineties. Well, now we are, and you can go into a business meeting and maybe have to come out all over again. But once you're out, you don't have to go back in, particularly on the coasts. Sure. So a lot of times when I deal with people from my age group, it's a lot of that shame of, of staying in the closet. Well, that doesn't need to apply so much to the younger generations. So mm -hmm. if you're an older executive, feeling comfortable about who you are is coming out of the closet. And that's something I, you help people with too, is because there is a, a, a perceived glass ceiling that most queer people my age grew up with. Mm -hmm. That glass ceiling, I wouldn't say it's being shattered, but I'm saying, I, I would say it's being melted away. Um, or it's just being circumvented and ignored. And this might be outside of the scope of this particular interview, but I'm curious from your perspective, do you think that's happening organically naturally is that because of the pushes that the lgbtq plus community is making or is there some other force that's sort of helping that to happen well look at you you got to follow the money you know Ch chase bank finally figured out that there's a lot of disposable income to be made in the queer community so they go after our they go after our money it really is it's just a, it's a corporate some algorithm somewhere that said oh look queer people have money let's go after that niche market Right. Particularly in travel, I, as I said, I, I owned a gay travel agency. Where's one place that queer people spend a lot of money? And it's on their trips, comparatively. Right. So it, it really is just there's money to be made by catering to the gay dollar or the pink dollar. Sure. So, uh, and we're seeing that more and more in corporate America. Right. So you brought this, this, this point up a couple of times throughout, and I'd like you to define it. What are esteemable acts and how can uh, incorporating them improve our, our well-being? Maybe oh, that's more a good specifically question. financial well-being. So an esteemable act is not always getting a new job or buying a new car. It can be, I'm going to drink a glass of water and complete that act. <laughs> I'm going to walk around the block one extra time. If you do that, your body goes, ding, that's a win. If you fail at something minor, your body's going to register a fail. But if you win at something or, or an esteemable act is a small thing and you build those up, your subconscious doesn't really know the difference over time between a huge win and a little win. So if you're feeling doldrumy, find little tiny esteemable acts that you can do. I'm going to get the clothes off my floor. I'm going to drink a glass of water with sea salt in it to help my kidneys. And if you complete that, once you drink that glass of water, your body goes ding, you put something on your list and you checked it off. That's an esteemable act. If you're trying to change your inner energy, 
Come up with small, esteemable acts that you can accomplish. Don't come up with one huge goal that you keep failing at every time you go to sleep. Yeah. Right. One, right? I did not know that salt water helps your kidneys. Did you know that? I did not know that. I did not well, know that. Sea salt, just a little bit, not too much. It's yeah. just we're we're not mineralized. Sorry, now we're getting into the other aspect of my work. But <laughs> you know, the the minerals that we have in our diet don't remineralize the body enough for the nerve synapses and the myelin to efficiently create communication for higher thoughts, say intuition, those higher vibrational things. So that's why I have my clients drink a little salt water after, like having a massage. You drink water afterwards. It's right. to get the the chi flowing in your body. Gotcha, gotcha. But I do like what you're saying because very often we're like, I have to do this monumental thing to feel worthy. But but if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you're saying, look for even, for lack of a better word, the smallest acts that yeah. you can come up with and sort of let those compound over time. And then you'll start to raise your vibration, which will then hope I you know, theoretically, I guess, allow you to have even slightly larger assumed blacks. Yes. Set esteemable, attainable intentions. Yeah. I like that. That way it's... you're not shooting yourself in the dick. Yeah. Excuse me, expression. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're not like stepping on your own feet. You're not tripping over your own, etc. It's fine. List 10 small things to do every day and do nine of those. You're going to feel a lot better than coming up with two large things that you can't accomplish and going to bed right. that night. Yeah. Right. And sleeping on the fact, I didn't get that done. Damn it. Yeah. I didn't call my accountant today. Damn it. Yeah. Or I didn't find an accountant today. Damn it. Well, get your papers in order. Get your receipts in order. Because if you call the accountant, you're going to still have to give them the receipts. So what's the easiest thing you can do to that pathway? Do that first. Check that off and, and keep building a plateau of esteemable acts. Sure. Yeah. It's like compounding in in your retirement accounts, right? I mean, the vast majority of people do not get to a million dollars in their retirement by putting in a hundred thousand dollars at a pop, right? They, it's it's the the twenty six dollars a paycheck. It's the forty five dollars uh, a month that just over time, because they get into the habit of being able to make that small investment, uh, that they are able to grow to their accounts to that size. Same thing with uh, our, our the habits in our lives. Mm -hmm. They're small emboldening acts, but they're emboldening. Yeah. If you have to do an emboldening act, you don't dip below that anymore. Mm -hmm. Your savings account isn't going to go any lower. It's only going to increase, whether it increases inc incrementally or large. It, it's still an esteemable act. You can still look at that and then apply it to other things in your life. Yeah. For sure. So you work with people. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what is that? Uh, uh, um working with you look like? What can somebody expect if they were to, uh, to hire you? So the sessions are an hour. It's over the phone. I don't need to see you physically because I see you in my mind's eye and I see your patterns. Um, and it really is. It's a personal session devoted to where your kinked hoses are, where the chi is not flowing, whether that means you have money issues because of the family you grew up in or money issues with your parents or what they went through and it applies to you. We're going to find the patterns that are... Uh, not causing you to, let me start over. Sorry. Okay. I, I got off track. Especially because I had to burp and then I couldn't think of what I was saying. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's a good question. So uh, sessions with me are an hour. They're very personalized to your situation. This isn't a cookie cutter aspect. I have many different somatic exercises we can do or energetic exercises, but I'm really going to choose and pick them catered to your specific situation. Whether you have an issue with a past life or a grandparent who uh, failed at family business. So now that story has been in your family and you just, it lives inside your body somewhere and you're not even aware of it. We're going to track that down. And then I'll explain through metaphor, a way for you to feel comfortable enough with your childhood subconscious to let that pattern go, either relinquish it, shift out of it, or just observe it. And in observation, it changes. That's basic quantum physics. If we observe our reality, our reality changes. So why people come to me is I'm a pattern reader. If you can't see your own patterns, you hire somebody to help you, mm -hmm. right? If you go to the doctor and tell them something's wrong, they're going to look for the cause or the root cause of that issue. I do very similar. I just do it in your energetic makeup or your stories. 
-hmm. And a lot of times the stories you tell yourself today don't resemble the originating story that caused the pattern to happen in the first place. That's another reason why you would hire, Mm -hmm. say, an intuitive or go to someone who's intuitive because they're going to see the root pattern for what it is, not the story it's become. Because if you try to solve the story it's become, you're not solving much. You're just telling more stories. Hmm. But if you see a pattern with money that relates to your patterns with men or your patterns in dating or your patterns with your family, generally they can repeat and it may not always be the money that's the root issue. It could be your power was taken away as a kid or you were ex- too much was expected of you as a kid. So now that you're not living up to that expectation, you're considered a failure. Yet you go to work every day loving what you do, but you go to family dinner on Sundays and you feel like shit because you're not living up to your family's expectation. That's a real hard judgment call. It's like back in the day when we had to to change our clothes to go out to the club, if you didn't feel comfortable leaving your house in in your club outfit, then you had to change your clothes to come back, right? Right. That luckily wasn't my story, but a lot of us had to change who we were when we leave our houses to become gay and then change back to who we, the face we had to put on in our own household. Well, very similar with money. If you pretend you're something, but you're not being that, then money's going to go, what are you? I don't know what you are, so I'm not going to stick to you. But if you say, I allow money in so it can be processed, or the world's a better place because I make money as opposed to my family might hate me if I make more money than them. Mm-hmm. Well, what a crappy way to to go to your job every day or your entrepreneurial ideas. If that's what's really going on in your subconscious, you got to let that stuff go like a, a balloon mm-hmm. and, and let it just dissolve into the ether. Yeah. But these patterns and these stories just come up and they come up. So this is what I do is I help people see their situation for where it's at accept that existing reality once you do that then you can change it gotcha. were you gonna say something you know it's it's okay it's it's not 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 appropriate or not uh, a part of this conversation at the moment no oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> now i'm very curious. i was gonna take us down a different path but we don't need to go that way <laughs> <laughs> right so um, before we wrap things up I, there's a question we've started to ask our guests um, just uh, because the general tone of the community seems to be pretty negative and heavy right now. Um, we're curious, what uh, what has you feeling positive or motivated or excited right now uh, about your life or the, the for the community as a whole? I see a lot more people accepting their own energies, accepting that intuition exists. I have a brand called Coming Out Intuitive, which is really about self-acceptance in terms of intuition, but it can be applied to almost anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, intuition was my thing that I needed to come to con- terms with, that I can stand up and say out loud, hey, I'm an intuitive, right? If, right? if I can say that out loud, then hopefully other people can say what they are out loud. So I have that brand coming out intuitive just for the sole purpose of helping people self-accept. Whatever their situation is, accept it. Once you do that, you can change it. If you keep fighting who, what you want or who you think you should be, you're going to keep doing that. So what I think is interesting is seeing more people talking about intuition, talking about energy healing, not getting caught in the rut of, you know, traditional therapies if they don't work for you. Mm -hmm. If you've tried traditional therapies over the years, like I did, and it didn't work for you, then it's nice that there's other things out there that you might find some solace in or some answers and that what I that's what I think is really interesting about what's happening now. Absolutely. Not just in the queer community, but just in our own lives. If we look inward, we might find real answers. You know, we've spent the last 30 years looking outward. Mm-hmm. And all it got us was a, a, a you know, the black mirror looking back at us, that screen. And that screen holds a lot of judgment. There's not a lot of uh, insights happening unless you're really going down educational rabbit holes. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Figure out what you like, go back to your childhood, remember what you liked doing as a child, and hopefully that can inform you as an adult. Absolutely. Well, this has been a a very interesting and exciting conversation. Um, You have a podcast. Uh, In addition to that, how else can our listeners connect with you if uh, they want to work with you? Sure. Uh, My podcast is called the Intuitive Energy Podcast. I talk about a lot of intuitive healing 
uh, discussions. It's things I would have liked to have known about 20, 10, 20 years ago when I was coming out as a burgeoning intuitive. I put it all in one place so people can get sort of a, access to valid non-dogmatic intuition information. Um, it's also about healing. And then I have my uh, website is scottclover.com, which is my name. Um, but generally try the website if you're interested in that kind of work and understand it from an energy perspective or you're curious mm -hmm. about your own intuition or your own energies, then those are the people that find me. And you will be able to address some financial concerns that people have in their life. Oh, definitively. If that's yeah. what you're calling about, if that's what you want that session to, to be about or the intention that we set at the beginning of the session is to wonder where my money blocks come from. And right. we find out that it's, you know, your grandfather who lost the, the family money and, and that pattern's been stuck through your, your family line. You're going to feel a lot of sense of relief once you understand that that's where the thorn is, has been in your side. That's just an example, but yeah. For sure. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been very insightful. Yeah. I'm happy to be I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Of course. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One NA member FDIC. Thank you, Scott, for a great interview and your insight, which will no doubt help our audience. Thank you for joining us for another episode. This week's newsletter includes your queer money takeaway and the resources mentioned in the episode. Join us this Thursday when we share the top five most unaffordable LGBTQ plus friendly cities to live in in each state. And next Tuesday when we're joined by a high net worth advisor who shares some of the secrets of the Uber rich. Ooh, thank you and have a great week. Mm -hmm.